And getting back to the theme of Yahoo Finance's Invest, I had a chance to sit down and speak to Klarna CEO, Sebastian Shimatkovsky, about the space. Take a listen. No, so it's actually very, very strong. And I think that this is one of the things where, you know, people may have not entirely understood buy now, pay later. I mean, a lot of things get labeled buy now, pay later nowadays, but our core model has been to do something very different to what the credit cards do, right? So the credit cards encourage you to put all of your uh, spending on, on credit. We encourage you to do debit or credit. Actually, 35% of our transactions are debit. And then we offer you a fixed installment and we charge zero interest. And what this means, it attracts consumers that are very thoughtful about their spending. People are tired of credit cards. They know that they're there to maximize your balance, to charge you as high interest rates as possible. Um, and the more cautious, more thoughtful consumers are choosing Klana because they're seeing it as a better option. You can see that in our losses. They're 30% below credit card industry standards. So these consumers are very thoughtful. Uh, they want to use this kind of alternative product. And, and they're tired of the old credit cards. And since you also see actually that they are in general doing better during more uncertain times like we're going through right now. And that's what, what we can see in our number. Our losses are down. We are uh, returning to profitability uh, uh, this, this quarter. And so it actually looks fairly well from that perspective. But at the same point of time, we can definitely see that consumer spending in general is weaker. And we see that among our merchants and our retailers that you know compared to a year ago, there's definitely less spending online in particular, but also in general. So that's interesting because you do have a really interesting insight into the consumer, Sebastian. So you're saying your take on the consumer here, you do see some some caution creeping in? Yes, I think what has happened, right, is that we're coming from, we're coming from COVID, we're coming from in the US distributed checks, people, you know, money coming from from the sky basically, right? And And then we had inflation and but we also had a little bit of that additional spending that happened when people were you know coming out of covid coming out of those restrictions and now people's savings have you know come down and their credit card debt has come up again we're over a trillion dollars of credit card debt now in the us again we're seeing you know an average five thousand dollars in in credit card debt so now people are starting to see the pr price differences they're starting to cut back on some uh, discretional spending and uh, yeah, and it is definitely a difference. And it always takes a little bit longer than you expect these changes in the market, right? And let me, uh, let me ask you also, Sebastian, about this, this rising rate environment we find ourselves in, because that can pose a, a challenge for the buy now, pay later segment. You know, one, pressures consumers, but two, you know, raising funding costs, pressures margins. How are you mm -hmm. navigating that challenge? Well, that's another thing that surprised you with the buy now, pay later. I mean, again, uh, there are other buy now, pay later people out there who are actually borrowing, you know, big amounts, big ticket items, and mattresses, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. And that's different. In our case, our average balance is only $100 to $150. And people pay it down. So we turn around our balance sheet 12 times a year. So actually, the cost of funding that balance sheet per loan is very, very small part of the cost. And this means that even in this in interest uh, environment, actually, our costs have risen very little. Uh, and at the same point of time, obviously, our offering has become more attractive because the credit cards have taken the opportunity to increase their rates. And so offering 0% interest-free credit right now is even more attractive than it was a year ago. So you, you, you see it's also a surprising part of the robustness of this model. And let me ask you about the, the regulatory landscape as well, Sebastian. You know, obviously, you're where regulators have taken more of an interest in the BNPL, the buy now, pay later market. How much of a risk is that for Klarna? And what do you see on that front coming up in 2024? Yeah, so we have gone through the same shifts in, in Europe. Uh, we've seen this in the UK. We've seen it in uh, in Brussels, in Europe, and so forth. I think a lot of this is obviously when there is a new form of credit coming, uh, Yeah, I think it's thoughtful and it makes sense of regulators to be a little bit skeptic. We've seen all types of uh, you know credit forms that have come that hasn't always been in the benefit of the consumers. So a lot of our work is just educating and showing uh, the regulators that this is actually an advantageous alternative to credit cards. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because many years ago, when you used to swipe your card, you would press, press one for debit, press two for credit. And then all the banks removed that. Why did they do that? Because you had a smaller balance at the end of the month if you also put some purchases on debit. And, and we're just trying to get back to those days. Um, and it turns that consumers, when they get those options, are actually spending more uh, safely and more thoughtfully. And so when we get the chance to actually sit down and show those numbers and have those discussions, then regulators, uh, you know, very quickly see this in a very different light. But obviously, if you're against credit altogether, if you don't believe people should ever use credit for any purchases, I'm not going to win a fight with you, right? So you have to recognize that still. 
Uh, but we think it's a better form of credit than the one that dominates the industry right now, which is the credit cards. I always recommend people to, sorry if I'm making a you know a competitive a potential suggestion here, but do watch Netflix credit cards explain. And I think you'll get a good summary of all the bad tactics that can, uh, credit card companies have applied uh, the last decades. All right, I'll plug there for Netflix as well. Let, let's talk, <laughs> um, Sebastian, about the history of Klarna, because you know, 2022, it was a tough year for Klarna, but as it was for many companies, inflation, rates, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I know you guys had to lay off people. You posted a $1 billion loss, reportedly cut the valuation. As an executive, as a CEO, Sebastian, what did you learn from that experience and what adjustments did you make to the business because of it? Well, I think first and foremost, right, I mean, the, the odd thing now is I look back at it to your point, the fact that we were investing so much that we were posting a loss of a billion dollars a year, right? It may sound a lot and it is a lot, but you also have to put that to some perspective as valuations were that high, but I was valued at $50 billion back then. This means that this is about a 2% dilution on an annual basis. And this is still, and I'm still very committed to this idea, Klarna is challenging the retail bank industry. This is a trillion dollar market opportunity. So there is very much real potential that this business could be worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillion, uh, if we accomplish what we've set out to do. And so I think, uh, but obviously investor sentiment shifted. Um, people weren't leaning as much into the future and wouldn't be, you know, wasn't willing to give you that credit for that future case. And they wanted to see profitability now. And that unfortunately then forced us to have to take very difficult decisions we had to make a change but i am quite proud of the fact that as an organization everyone came together um we turned around what was you know our worst month a negative ebitda of 150 million dollars and then 12 months later we posted our very positive ebitda since 2019 so i still think that's a pretty impressive feat by the team here and all the people that contributed to this who did all that work and uh, and obviously now we feel also encouraged that we when we realized that things were changing actually you know um, took that realized it was tough we had to do it but we did it and now we're benefiting from there because other companies who didn't act and and they are in bigger trouble now and, and Sebastian, I want to ask you some, some headlines as well, get your response that Klarna could face a strike at its Swedish headquarters if a collective bargaining agreement isn't reached with these two employee unions. Just walk me through that new Sebastian and what could it potentially mean for the business? Right. So um, this is a, a, a Swedish uh, thing where in Sweden, uh, most companies or a lot of companies have what we call a collective bargaining agreement. It's actually if you would take, you know, top 100 uh, there are only a few, us and Spotify, who do not um, uh, are not participating in that. Uh, it's not from a legal point of perspective. You know, uh, the Swedish law doesn't mandate you to sign this, but it's uh, it's uh, expected. Uh, and uh, but I think from our perspective, what we've been trying to do is create something even better. I mean, we pay our employees above what a collective bargaining agreement would give. We have better benefits, better. Uh, we offer them um, better um, all, all kind of employee benefits, so to speak. And um, and in addition to this, um, you know, we have created a very attractive environment where people want to work here. Uh, people who work at Klana are sought after in all of Sweden, all of Europe, and internationally nowadays as well. Um, so we will see how this uh, plays out, but we're hopefully that we will be able to come to a good resolution. Now let's talk about competition as well, uh, Sebastian. There's a lot of it, as you know, including a firm. Much is often made of the Amazon Affirm partnership. I'm interested, you know, are you all talking to big tech companies, big, big retailers about any kind of similar arrangement? Uh, for sure, all the time. I mean, if you look though, uh, at the U.S. market, over of the 100, top 100 U.S. retailers, more than half of them are working with Klarna today, and many more than are working with a firm, right? So I think a firm has been wise to strike a partnership with Amazon, obviously, with Shopify. But I think if you look at the rest of the market, Klarna has been extremely successful. And again, a firm is slightly of a different business. It's more of a fi traditional finance lender uh, in the sense that there's more high ticket, uh, big ticket value. Klarna is more focused on kind of an average $100, $150. So actually, from the outside, we've been kind of put in a box and said, this is the same thing. But if you actually look at the businesses much more closely, you realize that we are very, very different. And looking ahead now, uh, Sebastian, any interest in, in bringing Klarna public? And do you think that could be a, a 2024 event? Um, I don't think it's uh, unthinkable. Um, I mean, to me, I've been very consistent when I've been getting these questions a few times. And that has been that 
I believe that like, you know, uh, in order for Klarna to be ready, there was always a few things. I think there's a fantastic opportunity to build a global retail banking in the, uh, company. Um, it hasn't really existed. Yes, we do have some international brands in, in retail banking, but they're mostly just a conglomerate of local systems and local solutions under the same brand. So there's this fantastic opportunity to do that nowadays. And I think they're going to be the first banks. They're going to have 500 million consumers or a, a billion consumers. And we want to be that company, but we always recognize that in order to do so, we need to be successful in the U S uh, and successful in the U S obviously means a few things. It means have significant presence, which we now do with over 30 million users to be profitable and show that the business model work, which we're now on, we have three consecutive quarters of uh, gross profit in the U S and, and, and so those have been, you know, critical elements. And then the third thing is just more about market conditions. We are a bank. We're fully regulated. We already, you know, have to report on a quarterly basis. We have actually publicly traded uh, debt instruments and so forth. So it's not as big of a step. Uh, and I think now we're better positioned than ever to do it. So I wouldn't find it unlikely, but there's no commitment to a date or anything like that at this point in time. So an IPO is a possibility. I would think, Sebastian, what about selling the business? If, you know, Apple or a big bank came calling, would you take that phone call? <laughs> Look, I think it's my duty to my, my shareholders to always listen, right? But I think with, with that said, I, again, I feel that we're only at the beginning of this journey. Look, in a few, we've all, we had this vision that we formulated back in 16, which said that at some point of time, you're going to wake up in the morning and your computer slash financial assistant will say, hey, I analyze your mortgages. And I realized I could switch from bank A to bank B and save you $10 on your mortgage. And um, it will be as easy as saying yes. They will do, you know, the computer will do all the work for you, right? And this is where we think uh, retail banking and financial services is going, right? And so in that, in that future vision, who do you want to be? Well, obviously, you want to be the financial advisor that gave you that advice. Because if I do, maybe you tip me a dollar for doing it, right? And I think that's the only role to play in the future. And that's what banking was supposed to be. Somebody to care about you, not themselves. Somebody that cared about your finances, somebody that helped you, right? And when I see ChatGP and how we're applying AI now, I finally feel like, wow, I can actually see that coming to fruition very soon. And this is going to have a dramatic impact on this industry. I think it's ironic to see what fintech is going through right now from a valuation perspective, considering the fact that we're on the cusp of this transition that will seriously change this industry. And I am more convinced than ever when I see what we're building internally, what we're launching and what we're doing. This is coming now and it's coming soon. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. And that's why I think, you know, right now, I'm not convinced that would be a great idea to consider such strategic options as there's so much potential and it's really happening right now. All right, Sebastian, we'll be watching. And thank you so much, Sebastian, for your time and your insight today. We really appreciate it. Our thanks there to Klarna CEO, Sebastian Shimakovsky. So a couple of points um, on, on there, Kiko, that I want to, well, first of all, you heard us talking. There was this kind of risk there may be a, a strike by some staff in Sweden, but the company now telling me they've actually put that to rest. They, they did sign a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement with an employer's association. So that issue does seem to be in the rear view mirror. The other, of course, we talked about an IPO for Klarna, whether they'll make a public debut. Talk of that has kind of been heating up, and, and you saw Sebastian there did not rule out that possibility. Yeah, I mean, you get the sense that uh, a lot of these companies have sort of been waiting out, right, for the market to, to maybe become a little calmer, given the pipeline that we've seen so far. Maybe that's on the cards as well. What I thought was kind of interesting here, number one, the higher rates being a potential tailwind for the company. Yes, we've seen credit card companies with those higher rates. With that said, will consumers increasingly move towards buy now, pay later? At the same time, he kept talking about that 100 to $150 sort of, what is it, the, the, the average payment or the average usage for Klarna, which is a little surprising to me because you wonder, well, if that's the case, you know, how big of a bump are you likely to get out of the higher rate environment? Because what we keep hearing is that it's the bigger purchases that are being placed on credit cards. Yeah, exactly. So we asked him about that because I think investors have been nervous about that rising beta market. If they had money put to work in BNPL, buy now, pay later firms, you have seen that nervousness. I think what he was trying to do there is say, we're all not created equal. We have different models. We're serving different customers who are making different kinds of acquisitions. So 
when I asked you know, about rivals like Max Levchin's a firm, he was very quick to say, listen, yes, we're in the same space, but there are some important differences here. Well, and part of that is also that a lot of these companies, the buy now, pay later, the BNPL companies have received a criticism, right? Especially during the pandemic, when they saw huge growth to say, look, you are allowing the consumer to load up on debt, making it so easy to, to have those to use that in their purchases. I mean, that's partly the argument that he's making, that that's not necessarily what they're going for because these are smaller purchases in the grand scheme of things. You know, it's, it's interesting because that is a common criticism you hear. I checked in with Dan Dolev over at Mizuho, covers this space, knows these companies, and I asked him about that criticism. And his point was he thought, you know what, I don't see that in the companies that I cover, at least the way he covers. For example, he said a firm, which he knows well, he's got to buy in a firm. And Dan was telling me, listen, the delinquency rates for a firm are low. If it was true that they were all and Houston, they are often, in terms of the industry, younger consumers. If they're really getting loaded up on debt, you would expect to see higher delinquency rates, even in this high interest rate environment, he says, not seeing it right now. Yeah, and he did say what uh, Sebastian did say, trillion dollar market opportunity. So we're still talking about infancy. If we're talking about a trillion dollar market, potentially not just for Klarna, but for the overall BNPL space. Yeah, I, I, and I thought, listen, I thought it was interesting too, this talk of IPO, they just this week released their little, their recent financial results. And I thought what they reported was interesting, operating profit, the equivalent of $12 million for the, for the three months through September, they said. This is the company's first profitable result since the second quarter of 2019. If you were thinking, if you were thinking of making a public debut, that's the kind of results you think public market investors right now might want to see. They might want to see a decent bottom line. Just saying. Again, he didn't rule it out. He didn't rule it out. Now, a spokesperson did tell me, listen, no immediate plans. Yeah. Of course, immediate is a flexible word at Kiko, as we well know. <laughs> it's sort of like valuation. It's in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah. 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 Consider that on our watch list yeah. coming into 2024. Yeah. Josh, thanks so much for sure. bringing that the conversation.